is there, he's present, he's our Emmanuel. I don't know how you feel this season. I don't know what is going on in your life. The message of Christmas is the message of God who is with us, who is pursuing us. It's one thing to be there passively. It's not a passive God. It's a God that is actively pursuing us. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. And we ask this morning that you will speak your word into our hearts. We ask by your grace, by your power, you will minister to us. You will show yourself strong on our behalf. I pray and I submit my thoughts, my speech to you. And I ask, Lord, you will use them to minister to your people. Thank you because you've answered our prayer. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful drama by our children's ministry. That was, uh, that was shocking, right? The way they just uh, knew those lines. They just, uh, I mean, they just said them like they meant them. I mean, like, wow. Wow. That's, uh, that's incredible. We thank God for our children. They, that, uh, they allow God to use them to minister to us. I think uh, we all need angelic visitations, right? Especially during this Christmas season will be the most stressful season of, uh, of the year. Be a lot of challenges. Families go through a lot, especially extended families go through a lot. We are pressured with work, with family, with uh, everything we need to do. That It is so hard to enjoy the peace, to enjoy the hope, to enjoy the joy that Christmas brings to us. I think we need to pause and remind ourselves the purpose of Christmas. Hallelujah. And uh, we thank God that our children, they, they did that to us this morning. Amen. So I'm going to continue my message last week, uh, talking about God, and Emmanuel, God with us. And last week I started by talking about the God of the Old Testament, but mostly, you know, was depicted in the Old Testament largely as a distant, impersonal, and inaccessible. That was the God people worship. He was powerful all the same. He was a loving God. He was caring. He showed up every once in a while. But most of them didn't know a God that was close. He was distant. They did not know a God that was personal. He was impersonal. He did not even describe himself really as their father. So they didn't have such a personal knowledge of God. And it was also inaccessible. Imagine you are just being blocked from a place called the Holy of Holies. And this is where God dwells. And you are told you cannot enter into the place. How can you feel accessible to God that way? And that was their reality. The best they could do is to offer some bulls, rams, or turtle dove and give it to some priest to go into that place and offer it to them and to come and tell them that God accepted it. Wow. That was really their life. That was how, how much they could go and they could know God. Hallelujah. But Jesus changed. Hallelujah. Jesus came and he said, I am Emmanuel. I am God with you. God became flesh and came and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. So the God that we serve presented to us in the New Testament is the God that levels with his people. It is a God that is personal. And it is a God that is accessible. 
And don't let anyone fool you that you need to go through them to God. All right? Don't let anyone fool you. But the definition of ministers in the New Testament changed. Ministers are not priests. You see, priests represent people before God. That was, that was the job of priests. They were supposed to represent people before God. That changed. Priests now must show you the way to God. All right? So no one should fool you by saying you have to go through me to God. You need me to take your prayer to God. You need, no, you need them to show you the way. All right? You need them to help you to know God. You help them to teach you, to coach you. That's the job of ministers of the gospel in the New Testament. It's a fundamental change that people don't know, that people sometimes the Ministers themselves don't know, or they know and they're hiding it. They don't want you to know. Sometimes the people themselves don't want to know, all right? So they want the pastor to be the one to hear from God for them, know the will of God for them, you know, choose a husband for them, choose a wife for them. Yeah, people still do all kinds of stupid things like that. You know, take pictures of their daughters, you know, these two men, they want to marry my daughter. Can you tell me? That happens, right? It's all over the place. It's all over. You know, as it might sound oh, okay, religious, it is not scriptural. All right? And instead of the priest to say, no, no, that's not my job. No, my job is to pray with you, not for you. Hallelujah to join you so that you can hear God. Only God can tell you. have the same access to God as I have, especially as a matter that has to do with you. Hallelujah. Under the New Testament, you have become your own priest. Hallelujah. You now have access to God. We have an high priest, which is Jesus, that went before God and presented himself as a sacrifice for us, right? And because of that, we now have the way. So don't let anyone fool you that they are the way. Don't let anyone fool you that you need them to go to God. Don't let anyone fool you that without them, you don't have grace. You don't have anything from God. That is totally untrue. That is totally unscriptural. And don't let your problems and challenges fool you also. Because we become vulnerable, obviously, when we have problems when we have challenges, you know, everyone has problems and challenges. Even the priest you're going has problems and challenges that they don't, they are not able to solve. They're not able to, because we all, you know, still live in a misery, right? Uh, you know, when it comes to the things of God. So don't let anyone fool you that way, all right? Run away from people who want to be the way to God. All right, they are not. All right, embrace people and honor people who has made who have made it their responsibility to show you the way to God, to tell you you are indeed a royal priesthood. Hallelujah! You are a priest yourself. You have access to God. You can hear Him. You can know His will. You can understand His word. You can know who you are in Christ, and that is the job of ministers of the new covenant hallelujah that's a little diversion i believe the holy spirit wants people to hear that amen so god says i am here i'm emmanuel i'm present and i'm accessible I'm accessible you you won't die if you come to me even if you come with sin in your life the god of old testament you can approach him with sin in your life all right even the priest can go before him with sin. They'll die. I mean, that's the God. I mean, aren't you glad you're under the new covenant? I mean, just imagine we are in the old covenant. I mean, how this place will smell, right? <laughs> I mean, I can just imagine you go to church. I mean, have you gone to those places where we kill goats and rams to eat, I mean, right? 
All right, some of you have visited some of those farms, right? I mean, that's where, how church used to be. And you stay there, all right? You stay there, they kill it, they burn it, they do whatever, and you stay there. Now, it's no longer that way. And Jesus changed all that. And he gives us access. Now, he's even more than that. He now says, I am with you everywhere. Hallelujah. I am with you everywhere. I mean, you don't need to wait until you come to church to experience God. Jesus said, a time is coming when you won't need to go to this mountain, right? You won't need to go to this place. You won't need to go to this place, right? But those who worship me must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means in the spirit you worship God. Now, that doesn't discourage gathering because gathering is equally encouraged. You know, do not forsake the assembly of the people of God. The assembly and his physical assembly. It's not online assembly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not, you know, people, oh, I watch church online. How would there be church if everybody watches online? So the person playing the keyboard is playing it online. The person singing, singing it online. There won't be the church that you are watching online if everybody is as lazy as you. All right, so get off your couch and come to church. Amen. All right, so, so that's important to know the gathering. But essentially, we're gathering for a different reason. We're gathering because obviously God shows himself. God amplifies himself in the gathering of his people. That's what he does, right? Where so for two or three are gathered together, I'm there. It doesn't mean he's not, he has not always been there, but he amplifies himself, right? Where we are gathered, there's a presence that we create that we cannot create individually. When we gather together, there is, a, uh, there is, there is edification that takes place, you know, beyond how we can edify ourselves. Yeah, we can edify ourselves. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesies edifies the church. So when you come before you hear prophecy, you hear words, you know, you, you know, you know, prophecy can come and it comes during worship, during announcement, during prayer, it can come. Even as we greet each other, we prophesy. That means to we speak the mind of God. Hallelujah. So when we come together, there is and there is there, there is an amplification of God's presence that takes place that we cannot have on our own. But fundamentally, God is present with us. Amen. And that is the fundamental message of Christmas. Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. That is with him, I have God with me. Hallelujah. But the irony is we do not always recognize him. I think that's the, that's, that's, that's the essence of my message, which has, I'm still going to talk about today. That even though to that time he came physically to his own, his own did not recognize him, right? I mean, you spent thousands of years being not being able to see him. Now he comes and you don't even want him. And there are several reasons why they couldn't, right? They were blinded. Some of them, it was just, you know, they were looking elsewhere. He came in a way that they didn't know. He came too humble, too, you know, a child born in a manger. He came in such a way that they were not able. So many of them were too busy. It was a very busy time in Israel. So they were consumed you know, by what was going on. They were consumed by politics. People, many believers are consumed by politics. It's like their life depend on it. All right? You, they, so people miss Jesus because they were consumed by, you know, even when Jesus was talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, people, you know, the disciples started thinking politics. When are you going to restore, you know, the Israel to us? And Jesus said, look, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. All right? He said, it's not, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking politics. Yeah, sometimes we get distracted you know, by what's going on in the market, by politics, by events around us. 
and we can miss him because people missed him because of that. People missed him because the devil blinds them. And that was the devil's plot, to blind them. And he's still using the same plot today, you know, to prevent people. But there are people who recognize him. And we're going to look at their life. We're going to look, that's where we, we're going to look at the shepherd. And that's the people we read about, you know, in the scripture that we read. And I thought that was powerful, that the shepherds were chosen. They recognize him. Even though everybody missed him. Herod missed him. The priests missed him. The Pharisees missed him. The teachers of the law missed him. Everybody that was supposed to, they missed him. But the shepherds missed him. So we're going to look at some of the things we can learn about shepherds that make them qualify to recognize Emmanuel. The first thing about shepherds, Shepherds are lowly people. They were, you know, they were generally people considered low or of little value. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus chose those people as the first people, that God chose those people as the first set of people to recognize Emmanuel. Hallelujah. So lowliness is really an attitude of heart. And lowliness as expressed through our need for God is a major qualification to recognize the presence of God, to experience the presence of God. Even Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Poor in spirit are people who recognize their need for God. Oftentimes we miss God because we are not poor in spirit. We are rich in spirit. We think we are fine. We don't think we need him. I mean, we can sing about it, but we don't really believe it. I think uh, the, 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 the greatest time we lie most in church is during worship. You know, you know, we sing those songs that are so powerful, but we don't really mean them at all because we live entirely, totally differently. All right, we sing them, we talk about them, we pray them, but we don't. So being poor in spirit is recognizing I need God. Jesus actually said, without me, you are nothing, right? You need me. Without me, you are nothing. And when we truly have such an attitude, we are qualified. We put ourselves in a position to recognize God's presence. Hallelujah. The Bible says the Lord is close to the broken hearted. Psalm 34 verse 18. And saves those who are crushed in the spirit. In Luke 1 53, I believe Elizabeth was, you know, was, was busted out into songs, you know, and, you know, was prophesying. And one of the things he said about God is he has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he has sent away empty. The hungry are the poor in spirit, people who are spiritually hungry, people who need God, people who demonstrate their need for God, people who genuinely believe that they need his presence, they need him in their life to be able to be what God has called them to be. But the rich, he sends away empty. Jesus himself constantly tells us, it is not the healthy that needs a physician. Isn't that so? It is the sick. And Jesus said, I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. But he really meant people will believe they are righteous. People will believe they are in need. You know, people will be, I mean, they will believe they don't have any need. People will believe they are full, they are comfortable, they have everything they need. That's why we don't experience God that much, especially in this part of the world. That's why people, other people, that's why we're talking about China. They experience, people who are saved there, they experience God so much more. That's why they are still saved. Because why will you stay saved in that kind of environment? When you are being monitored, you are being 
you know, I mean, life is difficult. You can be arrested. So they have underground church. That's what they have in China, underground church. They have underground church. So when they have the Bible, they memorize the Bible. That's actually their life there. So people smuggle Bible. They don't smuggle Bible in whole. They smuggle them in pieces. You know, you tear them. You know, you, you know so they get a little piece, all right? And they reach, they memorize, they pass to the next person. That person, you know, discreetly, you know, also try to memorize. And that's how they live. So the scripture, all of a sudden, they are hungry for it, right? The hunger for it is there. I mean, we have it, I mean, everywhere we turn around, right? On our phone, we can buy Bible for a dollar. I mean, just Bible is everywhere, and we don't even reach all right? We don't. We don't read. And it's not that we don't know how to read. We're not just interested in reading. I mean, we can read pharmacology book, how big. I mean, those, we can read, you know, calculus. We can study all those things. I mean, we do all that, you know, but when it comes to Bible, we don't have time. I mean, we don't, you know, we just, we don't have half an hour. We'll have, we'll, we don't have an hour. Who we'll has an hour to read the Bible these days? Where, is the, where am I going to find that time, you know, to read? That? That's our attitude. We have no hunger for him. We are not poor in the spirit. No wonder we don't recognize him when we see him. I'm praying that God will give us such an attitude, an attitude of lowliness, an attitude expressing our need for God. If we express our need for him, we are going to see him. Every other person didn't need him. The shepherd, the lowly people were people who were able to recognize him. Another thing we see about shepherd, stillness of heart is their attitude. They are still. You know, and they, they have to be still because they have to be attentive. They have to listen. They have to listen to, they have to, they have to listen to what is going on around them. All right? Because the sheep are in danger. So stillness of heart is very important. When we are too busy, too worried, too consumed, it is difficult to recognize God, to recognize his presence. When we have a lot in our mind, you know, and that's why one of the things we must deal with is to be still. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am. Right? See, being still in our heart. Being, to be still means to be quiet. To be quiet in our heart. Not to be rowdy. You know, when we're so rowdy in our minds, obviously we're going to be rowdy in our life. When we are so rowdy, we miss God. Because God is often subtle in the way he does it. So people who are rowdy, Obviously, everybody was busy that season. They missed Jesus. I mean, they missed him. So, I mean, it, it was a big miss. Big miss. You know, his arrival was missed by everybody. I'm sure they will look back and say, how did we miss him? How? Couldn't even find a place for him to be born. Can you imagine? No, I mean, no place. I mean, no hotel booked. I mean, even the guy that was, who, you know, maybe he's a guy, maybe he's a girl, I don't know. I mean, who, 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 was, who was the receptionist at the hotel? I mean, just like, I mean, how do, you, how do you turn away a woman that is about to give birth? I mean, why can't, why can't you announce? Can someone give their room? I mean, this, this lady is about to have a baby. I think as bad as we are in America, I don't think anybody would do that. I think, we're, I mean, even in the East Coast, we are so busy. We are so, I mean, you see a woman about to give birth, everybody is out of the way. Someone will say, you know what, I give up my room. Nobody gave up their room to Jesus. That tells you there's something wrong. Stillness allows us to see, and that baby turned out to be Jesus. Wow. I'm sure that hotel closed down after. There was a, there was a story 
a few years ago, I believe this happened in the UK, where the hotel business decided to make up for that error. And they allowed anyone that is named Mary or Joseph to come and stay for free. <laughs> I thought I was, I mean, and that was, this was actually true. I mean, they actually announced that if your name is Joseph and you're Mary, you, one night on us, just one night on us, you know, maybe we can make up, but they can. It's too late now. Another Jesus is not about to be born. We missed him. They missed him. And we also do miss him because we are too busy. We are not still. You know, stillness is an attitude we must cultivate. All right? It's amazing now that it's, it's called mindfulness now. If you go to a lot of establishments, schools now, they are introducing what is called mindfulness into their curriculum because people are no longer still. People are no longer, I mean, when we are not still, we are not mindful. We don't even recognize who is hurting around us. That's, what, that's how bad it is, right? We don't recognize who is hurting. We don't recognize who is going through. We don't recognize, I mean, we are too busy. We are too rowdy. We are not able to pay attention. Stillness is very, is necessary. And the next thing is attentiveness. Very linked, but it's also very distinct. Because attentiveness has to do with our ability to listen to instruction. You see, the shepherd were people who could listen to instruction. Otherwise, inability, I mean, if we are not able to listen to instruction, we will miss God. Oftentimes, we experience God because we listen to his quiet instruction. All right? We listen. Many times, people are not attentive. I mean, if you look at, uh, if you read the proverb, Proverbs devoted a lot of his time to talk about attentiveness. My son, pay attention to my words. Attentiveness is something we must cultivate as believers who are really seeking God and who want to experience him. Otherwise, you will miss him. Habakkuk, in Habakkuk 2, 1, Habakkuk said, I will stand at my watch. You know, I will stand on my rampart, right? And watch and station myself on the rampart. I will look to see what he will say to me. That's an attentive person. Looking to see. As I'm preaching now, some people are distracted. They are not attentive. They're on their phone. They are texting back and forth as if they run the world. Right? Like, you know, they must answer all those texts. Otherwise, somebody, you know, something is going to crash. I mean, the, the universe is just going to get destroyed because I'm so important. You know, I just don't want the world to stop because they need me. So I got to have my phone. I have to be texting back and forth. You know, I have to post those things on Facebook because, you know, Facebook is not going to make money unless I'm there. You know, you know, we're not attentive sometimes. We're so distracted. We're so not attentive, not waiting. Because, you see, one thing about God is someone can speak for half an hour, but it's a phrase or two in there that is for you. Right? I mean, it's just meant for you. I mean, it's just, I mean, even the person saying it, if you go back to him, he'll be like, did I say that? But they said it. Sometimes it just comes out, but it's for you. And you know. And the Bible says, the spirit bears witness with our spirit. Your spirit tells you that word is for you. How many testimonies have we had like that? And someone say, a pastor, so, 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 and so, and I just key into that word. And every other person did not even hear that word. I mean, but it is in the process of being attentive, all right? Attentiveness is an attitude of shepherds. Shepherd must be attentive. Otherwise, they will lose their sheep, right? They must be attentive. They must be attentive. I mean, sheep don't talk that much. Sheep are not, you know, that expressive. Sheep can be easily fall, can easily fall prey, you know, to wolves, to other kinds of animals, to snakes, to all kinds of things. So shepherds are very, very 
very attentive people. That's why Jesus himself, Jesus calls himself the shepherd, the good shepherd, because he's attentive. He's attentive to us. So when we pay attention, we must be very attentive. Look at what the angel, the angel appeared to the shepherd. He gave them an instruction. He said, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. That is the Messiah. All right? Now, the funny thing is this, this, is, this happened among the midst of other things because there were a lot of things going on. If you, if you study that story, there were a host of, it wasn't one angel, it was multiple angels. There was worship going on. There was, you know, they were even terrified. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a very, it was, this came in the middle of all that, an instruction came. How attentive are you? Let's be attentive. Attentiveness is very necessary if we're going to recognize what God is doing. Sometimes God speaks in different ways. He speaks in patterns. He speaks quietly. He speaks through things going on in our life. He speaks through other people. He speaks through children. He speaks through people that you don't even like sometimes. All right? Sometimes God will, somebody will, he will raise someone that you don't necessarily think too highly of. All right? But attentive people are able to recognize him. I pray that God will give us that grace for attentiveness in Jesus' name. In 1 Kings 19, we have a powerful story of, uh, of the prophet, Elijah, who was, you know, God, God instructed Elijah to go before the Lord. God said, go out and stand on the mountain. And God said, I will pass by. And I'm going to speak to you. And he went. And a lot of things happened while he was there. The Bible says the Lord passed by, truly. But there were a lot of things when the Lord, when the Lord passed by. The first thing that happened was a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rock in pieces. I'm reading verse, uh, I believe, verse 11 now. He said, broke the rock in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Can you imagine? Sometimes there could be earthquake. There could be a lot of things going on. You know, sometimes we also need to be careful when there are manifestations around us. We get distracted. You know, you get distracted. You think, no, 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 no. Don't get distracted. Just be very careful. So, so there was something happened. The next thing that happened after the wind, an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, a still small voice. See? But the Lord was, that was the voice of the Lord. The Lord was in that still small voice. So maybe the Lord has been speaking to you through a still small voice. But you're not attentive. You're waiting for the earthquake. You're waiting for the fire. You're waiting for the strong wind. You know, but the Lord is coming in a still small voice. He's telling you, don't do that thing. Right? Each time you think about it, you have that check. You know, he's telling you, this is what I want you to do. He's telling you, you need to embrace this person. You need to forgive this person. You need to give up this. You need to give up that. Being attentive is needed. Hallelujah. The next thing the shepherd has is faith for obedience. Faith for obedience. I mean, they, they must have faith to believe that the Messiah is in the manger. I mean, that's just, I mean, this is not like, I mean, now maybe if it happens again, we can believe. Right? I mean, like, I mean, you, you gotta have some faith that the angels just say, okay, you know, you're gonna find the baby is in the manger. I mean, who gives back to a baby in the manger? I mean, if you're, I mean, if you're legit, right? <laughs> I mean, you're going to say if you're legit, I mean, don't you have family? I mean, you're, you're, you're just going to question those things. Sometimes God's instructions are so stupid. 
right? They are so stupid. The foolishness of God is wiser than man, right? I mean, God's instructions can be so foolish. What he's telling you to do can, may not make sense. I mean, so that's why obedience really requires faith. Our ability to believe God, even when it doesn't make sense. And we have to predetermine to do the will of God so that we can experience him. Oftentimes, God doesn't show up because he knows. Why will I waste my time to show up? All right? Jesus said, <clears throat> Jesus, I believe, said in, in, uh, in John 5.30, he said, by myself I can do nothing, talking about himself. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, because I seek not to do my, uh, please myself, but him who sent me. Hallelujah. See, when, when our desire is to please God, we experience him. All right? We are able to experience him. But when he knows we are not going to, because, and the Lord knows. God knows people who, no matter what I tell them to do, they are not going to believe. Hallelujah. So look at what the shepherd said in Luke 2, 15 and 16. They said, Let, let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. I mean, they didn't even go. They hurried off. They quickly went and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. My question for you, if the Lord shows up, you see, don't forget the Lord doesn't just show up to show up. He shows up because he wants to do something, right? There's an instruction. Something is interested in there's some there's something is going to do in your life. There's something he shows up. Are you ready? Are you willing? Hallelujah. That's why the shepherd were qualified. They were they were not they didn't question, they didn't rationalize. They were not people, they just went. Hallelujah. And lastly, there's something about them. <clears throat> they spread the news. I love that. Willingness to share what God has done in our lives. And you see that in uh, verse 17. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what God had told them about this child. I believe those are, that's some of the lessons we can learn from the shepherd. Why they became the people who recognized Emmanuel when the other people missed him. <clears throat> I pray that we will be like those shepherds. In our life, the way we live, we will be people who are attentive, people who have a lowly heart, people who express sincerely our need for God, people who are attentive, who are still, and will have faith for obedience in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's bow down our heads. I'd like to pray for some people today. There's a still small voice talking to you, saying you need to surrender all to Jesus. You know, that's, you know, as I'm speaking, you're, you hear that witness in your spirit. I want you to obey that still small voice. I don't want you to resist. That's a still small voice inviting you. Some of you is inviting you into a relationship with him. A relationship with him that does not exist. You know in the heart of your heart, you don't have a relationship with God. But this can be a beginning. For some of you, he's inviting you into a deeper walk with him. Much deeper than what you have. I'd like you to raise up your right hand because i like to pray for you. I believe the Lord wants me... God bless you, my sister. God bless you. Any other person in the house? I don't want you to. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. I believe there could be a few more people. Thank you. We have a third person. We have a fourth person. I don't want you. We have a fifth person. God bless you. Sixth person. Hey, God is good. Amen. I want, I'll give you 10 more seconds in case there's any other person here. Who want to say, you know what I'm hearing? That's this small voice. He's telling me I needed a relationship. 
If you raise up your hand, just stand where you are because I want to pray just for 10 seconds and I want to make sure I know who I'm praying for. Just stand where you are, please. Just stand where you are. God bless you. Just stand where you are. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Just stand where you are. If anybody, any other person want to join them, I want you to. I don't want you to, I don't want you to really be ashamed, you know. Some of you is into a new relationship. Some of you, you've had it, but you've lost it. Some of you is not, it's really non-existent that much. But he's inviting you. As I'm speaking, you're, you're hearing that witness in your spirit for a deeper walk. And I want you to place your hands on your chest. If you're, you know, because I'm going to lead you into a prayer. I'm going to lead you into a prayer. And I want you to say, Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you because no matter how much I run away from you, you are always pursuing me. And thank you for today. And today, I choose to obey. I choose to open my heart. I choose to have you come in. I choose to accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I choose to seek and pursue you. I choose to know you deeper. I choose to go the extra mile. I choose to obey. I choose to step out. And I'm asking you for grace. I'm asking that you will help me. I'm asking that you will forgive me. You will cleanse me. Take me into a deeper walk with you. Thank you. Because you've answered my prayer. In Jesus name. Amen. You can have your seat. I'm going to pray. Just wrap up. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for Christmas. A reminder that you are with us. Today I'm especially praying for people who are in dire situation. They need you more than ever. Some of them financial crisis. Some of them relationship crisis. Some of them, you know, immigration crisis. Some of them, it's just personal crisis, crisis of fulfillment, crisis of purpose in life, crisis of meaning, and they need you, they need you to show up. So today I'm agreeing with them, and I'm asking, and I'm pleading in the mighty name of Jesus that you will show yourself strong. In the next few days, you will let it be so clear that you love them, you are interested in them, you are watching them, you are walking with them through the fire. Some of them are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, death and they want to know, Lord, are you with me? I'm praying in the name of Jesus, you will show them that you are with them. Let them, let them, let them have a sign, let them have a reality, let them have something, Lord, show yourself and come in, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Some of them want to make decisions, critical decisions they need to make, especially as they go into the new year and they need to know you are there. They just need to know. So my Father, today I'm just reaching out and I'm praying on their behalf and I'm asking that you will show yourself strong on their behalf in the mighty name of Jesus. You are Emmanuel. Show yourself as Emmanuel. Jehovah Shammah, show yourself as God that is present. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you honor because we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.